You know, in any business, the the best leaders of the businesses I've seen that are most successful is the leader surrounds himself with people who are outstanding and better than he is. Uh, when you have good employee base, and I do, I have the best uh, uh, executive vice president, I have the best uh, chief of operations, and I pay them well because they are the ones that really make the railroads run smoothly. So surround yourself with good talent is what makes you successful. Oh, there's a lot of, you know, one is I, I get to do a business that's a lot of fun. You know, uh, uh, historic scenic railroads like ours, we're in the historic preservation business, we're in the education business, but we're also in the entertainment business. And uh, so I get the satisfaction of having a noble purpose to preserve history, but I also get to have moms and kids and, and, and old railroad fans come up to me and just thank me so much for what I do with railroads. That's what's the most fun, is seeing people happy with what you do. In addition, uh, I own railroad museums as a part of my railroad operations. Here in Durango, I have a 10,000 square foot museum, and it's, it gets to be an excuse for me to go out and buy toys. I buy historic train memorabilia, all sorts of things that I use here. I have the seventh largest collection of Line L trains at our railroad in North Carolina. I have a uh, about a 50 by 50 LUT train layout here in uh, Durango, Colorado. So I, I get to play a lot. There's a lot of people that think uh, working for a railroad is unique and a lot of fun. So there's a lot of people working for us. Uh, we're a seasonal business. Uh, year round, for example, in the Durango and Silverton, I have 100 employees. Uh, during the peak summer season, though, it goes up to 220. And so there's a lot of turnover of part-time people, seasonal people, some who come every year, year after year after year. For somebody that wants to get into the operation side versus the railroad industry in general, but I really think a lot of what you need to emphasize is you need to have a sellable skill. And as an example, somebody who is really good at an accountant, as an example, might be able to get a job with a railroad if that was their passion. But you need to have a skill. So there's that side of it. And then there might be somebody who wants to become in the, in the mechanical side. Again, you need a skill. You need some, a reason to hire somebody. So you need to become a mechanic, a welder, a machinist. Bring a, bring a trade or a skill with you and you're going to have a lot better chance. You're going to progress better and you're going to become more part of the organization quicker. And of course in operations, you know, I think sometimes people underestimate the amount of literacy required, how much writing is required, reports. So when you have the ability to write well, speak well, communicate well, and you have those skills, then you can bring that to the railroad and that's going to give you a leg up getting hired, coming into whatever part of the company you want to come into. If someone comes in with no skills and just wants to get into the railroad industry, they're going to have to be comfortable working at some of the more tedious jobs to start with. And since that's how I came up, I really have no problem with somebody who comes in and learns on the job, but if you do that, you have to understand that you've got a lot of uh, work to do to get to the point where you're going to have opportunities to be promoted and move into some of the more sought-after positions. Yeah, we actually in Durango, we'll, we'll have in the ballpark about 180,000 people that will run on some form of train event each year. And our railroad in Durango is very, very fortunate because we have the facilities to do most of the work ourselves. So we, we will do a 1,472 inspection and it will cost us somewhere around $250,000. Depending on what railroads you have and what availability to, to labor and technology and understanding as you have as a business, I've seen some of these inspections go up to the five, six, seven hundred thousand dollar range just to be compliant. Depending on, it just depends on what you can do in house, what your equipment looks like, what your locomotive needs for that inspection to be completed. But we do them a lot cheaper here just because of the fact that we've done several of them, we're good at it, um, and we have the equipment we have to do most of it ourselves. And we really have, and this is a real railroad, it's not a, it's not a, a Disneyland, it's not a, a toy. And uh, we've had major rock slides that have blocked trains from coming down completely that took five, six, seven days to clear the line, where we've had to back the train back to Silverton and get buses to get the passengers back uh, to Durango and then of course 
you have two trains sitting up in, in Silverton, so then you've got to get crew up there to get the locomotive service, because obviously with the steam engine you can't just turn off the key and walk away from it. And so, yeah, there's, there have been things like that that do occur. It doesn't happen very often, but when they do happen, then you have to be ready to react. And, and yes, I do get out on the trains. We do rely a lot on our crews for input. But we also, through our reservation system, our marketing system, we do a very extensive research survey that we hit about to 20 or 25 percent of our passengers that actually rate us on, I think, as many as 30 different criteria on the trip. And we gain a lot of information from that, that, that you know, survey. And then we look at the things that are regular occurrences that people complain about or think that they, we can improve on. And we focus on, on that. But we also take a hard look at the, what people really like. And we want to make sure they're about the trip. We're oriented with the train. There's 54 here. And there. Slides that block trains from coming down completely that took five, six, seven days. Slides that block train slides that. And there. Um, in about the trip. Um, when I first started working here, um, I actually hired on in the concessions department in 2008. Um, it was a short-lived experiment, I guess, if you will, because I was only in concessions for about a month or a little bit more, and then a position opened up in the operating department as a brakeman, and I uh, was able to, you know, get that position and train became a brakeman, and uh, just kind of move forward and progress from there. Um, in that time, I've you know done everything from engine service up in the locomotive, uh, trainmen, you know positions, brakeman, conductor. Um, I've you know trained to become a dispatcher up here. I've been up here as a dispatcher for, gosh, probably been a little over three years now. I'm guessing maybe closer to four. Um, my first year, you know, got involved with Polar Express and did a lot of things with you know the the head chef position in terms of organizing all the chefs and everything that were involved with uh, kind of choreographing and you know entertaining people on the on the train. Um, I've worked out in MOW, I've done a little bit of work in the roundhouse and the car shop, so I've been pretty flexible with what I've learned to do over the years, so more than I, I anticipated when we first moved out here. Um, yeah, I mean all of them, you know, at least start out with a concessions position. Um, when I worked that, you know, it was you work on board the train, the concession car. Um, hold on, one second, please. Dispatcher, over. Hey, Paul, clear Cascade Canyon at this time. I'd like to go ahead and release that authority. Get a new authority, Cascade Canyon, back to you south and also over. So I understand. Uh, stand by one moment, over. Thank you. Thank you. Dispatch hour. Hey Jeff, what's going on, sir? Uh, we got a patrol. They're going to be coming down by uh, Tacoma and into Rockwood probably in the next 20 to 30 minutes. Uh, so we should be able, once they go through, to get you in there. Okay, sounds good. We'll talk to you in a bit. Thanks, Jeff. Dispatch to 9000, over. 9000, dispatch. So I release track authority number 1 at 8.43 a.m. I have new track authority number 2 for 9000. It begins at 8.43 a.m. to go from Cascade Canyon to South Formosa, ending at 10.30 a.m. That's going to be against train 261, over. Track authority number one was released at 843, picking up track authority number two beginning 843, Cascade Canyon to South Formosa ending at 1030 against the 261, over. That is correct, no okay, at 844 AM, over. Copy 844, dispatch will give you a switch report here in just a few minutes, 9,000. Understand, uh, is Tank Creek in service, over? Uh, that is correct. It is up and running and no problems. 
Okay, I understand. Uh, Tank Creek is in, sirs. Thanks. I'll talk to you here in a little bit. The dispatcher out. My job now. Um, where was I? Uh, with concessions, you know, when I first started, you know, you're working on board the train, and it's great because you get to be uh, just like any trainman position, kind of the face of the company in terms of interacting with people and dealing with people. Um, you know, your primary service to the you know, company in that position is basically serving food and beverage uh, to the people as you go to and from, whether that's Cascade Canyon or Silverton. Um, you know, and just kind of as you moved up a little bit uh, with a brakeman position uh, and with a conductor as well, uh, you kind of become more oriented with the train. Uh, where your duties are kind of split between, you know, being the face of the company and servicing, you know, the passengers as best you can with regards to, uh, you know, whatever needs might come up during the trip. But you're also very, um, you know, focused on, you know, the operations of the train itself, you know, what's going on, you know, with each car, with the consist, uh, performing brake tests, keeping an eye on everything, making sure everything's kind of uh, mechanically sound and you know where you want it to be and you know in addition to that you know they uh, you're kind of expected to be able to fix certain things as they occur along the line if you uh, you know run into a hot box or if you run into some sort of other you know abnormality that you could you know possibly change out the brass or if you need to cut a car out do things like that and so that's kind of your focus uh, the conductors obviously you know, the person who's going to be in charge of the crew, uh, both his, you know, trainmen. Also, he's in charge of the engine crew as well. Uh, he's responsible for doing all the paperwork and being able to turn that in, submit it. Uh, when you look at the uh, engine crew, uh, you have uh, both the firemen, the engineer up in the locomotive. Um, the two of them kind of work together as a team up there, where uh, the fireman is responsible more or less for running the boiler. Uh, keeping it stoked, keeping your pressure up, keeping your water maintained.